Privit, Privit, greetings from Odessa, Ukraine, on the shores of the Black Sea, got the Black Sea out here to my left. And I'm walking through the center of Mount Primorsky Boulevard here, right in the center of Odessa. And so many of you have written to me in the last month asking me, Connor, what the hell is going on in Ukraine? I get so many people sending me articles telling me to leave Ukraine. Invasion is imminent by Russia, in particular here in Odessa, where I am at the moment. Also, people telling me that it's all just hysteria in the Western media. Nothing's going to happen. Russia doesn't want to invade Ukraine again. Take a chill pill, all will be good. So I've already actually made a video on this, I guess we can call it crisis at the moment between Russia and Ukraine. It's about a month ago. And I'll link it, if you haven't seen it, up above in a card and down below in the description. And in today's video, I don't want to repeat the same background to the current uh, crisis uh, since I've already done that. And actually, I have to say that the comments under that video on the whole were actually pretty good, even from people who didn't agree with my point of view. So in grosso modo, in summary, Ukraine, the source of conflict is basically Ukraine wants to go westward towards the European Union and towards NATO with the promise of prosperity of being in the European Union and obviously a security guarantee um, from Russian aggression in the future by joining NATO. And Russia, as you can imagine, is not too keen on that and they want to persuade, shall we say, Ukraine to stay in their orbit. But I've gone into a lot more detail in that first video, so go and check that out if you haven't seen it. And in today's video, I want to deal with a few more, I guess, practical issues for you, which is number one, how to deal with the conflicting media that you can find online and not obviously on your TV screens uh, in your home country, especially the English language media, because I keep getting so many people sending me articles or YouTube clips uh, telling me completely opposite things all the time. So I want to give you a little bit of guidance about how you can make up your own mind about what you're hearing. And number two, answer the obvious question, which is, should you come to Ukraine at the moment or should you stay away? And number three, if you are already here, well, should you be planning to pack your bags and leave right now or should you stay on? That's also my personal situation, of course. As you can see, I'm here in Odessa, uh, 1st of February. And yeah, I haven't left so far. So let's get into the video today. Bye, Sar experience. So as you can see, it's a peaceful Tuesday afternoon here in Odessa. People are going around their normal business. No one is panicked. There's food in all the shops. I can go to my favorite cafe and drink a flat white. Uh, people have not, you know, abandoned the city. So things more or less go on as normal here for the moment. And now if you were watching a lot of media, no matter where it is, especially in the English language, which is mainly the one that I watch, you would think that, you know, Ukraine, cities like Odessa, Kiev, maybe Kharkiv, there's already a war going on in the city center because things sound so dramatic. Now, how you should ask yourself, why is that? And how are media companies and people on YouTube other YouTubers, maybe they're not exactly a media company, but they're commenting on what's going on here in Ukraine, including me, obviously with this video. How are they making money? Well, they make money, not all of them, but most of them, through ad clicks on the videos. So if they don't have a sensationist title at the very least, whether it's print media or video media here, then you and everybody else who consumes the media is probably not going to click on it, which means they're not going to make as much money. And I've seen this quite a bit when people have sent me personally articles and the headline is so sensationalist. Russian invasion imminent. Or Russia says they will not invade, right? So two extremes, we'll say. And Often when I read the body of the article or I watch the video itself, 
Well, that's not really what it says inside. <laughs> it, they just knew that more people are likely to click on it if they have a sensationalist title and maybe they have sensationalist content afterwards as well. So that's just something in general with the media that unfortunately he who is the most, he or she, uh, who is the most sensationalist makes the most money often, right? And that's obviously a perverse incentive. So that is the first issue that you have with all media. Now, YouTubers, not just the mainstream media, are also guilty of this because you'll see a lot of um, people who run, will say, entertainment channels. So they don't really have a business per se uh, that they're trying to promote on YouTube, but they're basically going after clicks, right? So they need that clickbait as well. And maybe they don't know very much about what's happening in Ukraine, but with a sensationalist title and their existing big audience, they know making uh, a sensationalist video about Ukraine is probably going to make them some nice packet of dollars or euros or I know rubles or whatever it happens to be. So they also have an incentive to start commenting on things that yeah, really they don't know anything about, but simply for the, uh, for the number of clicks and the money they make out of it. Just be aware of that, obviously. Uh, I think most people understand that. At this stage, that's how most business models online work. Not all, some people sell, you know, um, they have their own business and they're you know, trying to build up something else and they happen to be maybe in Ukraine, a bit like I am. Uh, maybe they're uh, running a dodgy marriage agency, but okay. <laughs> they're probably not trying to get you to click on it for the clicks since they run a different business. And uh, yeah, maybe sometimes they actually are uh, reasonably well informed. But in general, you're gonna see a lot of commentators uh, here on YouTube who basically don't know anything. And probably what they do, I suspect, is they read a few articles or watch a few videos from the media that they normally consume and they will just repeat the talking points that they've read without really understanding any of the context or really what's going on. So how do you avoid making the mistake that I think a lot of them make, mistake in the sense of the quality of what they produce, not how they make money? Well, what I do is I actually read and I consume a variety of media on a certain topic, even people I don't like <laughs> and I don't agree with at all. I still watch their videos uh, to get the other perspective so that I can, you know, see if I agree with them or I think it's all a load of propaganda or whatnot. There are people, we'll say, who are mainstream media or pro-Western media and there are a lot of factors that go into the type of content that they're going to produce. For example, maybe they're part of the military industrial complex. They just want to sell weapons and they want confrontation with Russia, right? They want confrontation with Western Russia. Then you have people who have maybe built an entire career around uh, commenting on, you know, Russia or Russia's a threat and Russia being the news is great for their career. So they're going to be, you know, on CNN telling you that Russia is a major threat and whatnot, right? They have an incentive at least to do that. Maybe they also believe it. And you have people who support, we'll say Western style democracy, liberal democracy, and they want to support, in this case, Ukraine, because, well, liberal democracies are in general uh, friendly to each other, and they would rather see that prevail than the alternative in Russia, right? So, you know, always understand that people are analyzing what they observe through the lens of their own Weltanschauung or worldview. And that is very important. So on the flip side, you have media outlets that are not the mainstream. They're maybe sometimes described as being uh, to the far right of politics, whether you agree with that categorization or not. And a lot of them tend to see President Putin of Russia as a strong man. A good man. Uh, he's not a communist. He's anti-woke. He's traditional values, right? So they would maybe advocate on his behalf because they share those values. On the flip side, again, you have the Marxists, the radical left. They, in general, seem to find things like the European Union, U.S. imperialism, as anathemas. So. European Union 
is obviously one of the reasons the European, let me rephrase that, the European Union and its promise of prosperity is one of the main driving forces here in Ukraine wanting to leave Russia's orbit. Right? And, well, they hate that because, well, I mean, how many prosperous Marxist societies have you seen? Well, they prioritize, you know, a low discrepancy or, or um, difference between rich and poor in the society, right? They, everybody being equally poor is maybe their preference over, you know, prosperity, but large differences between rich and poor. And they tend, well, they're definitely in general anti-American imperialism, which, you know, a lot of them, which seems strange, I guess, in this context, because they're not anti-imperialist per se, if you, you know, perceive Russia as the imperial power or former imperial power in the region. It's a little bit of a, a difficult uh, position to marry in your head, maybe. But anyways, double think <laughs> is my way to describe it. So, uh, from what I can see, it seems to be a case of my enemy's enemy is my friend, or my adversary's adversary is my friend in this case, uh, with the uh, West lined up in front of Russia in this crisis or in this standoff. Now, I think in general, you should read all of a bit of different types of media, obviously with the different worldviews in mind when you read what someone is you know, an editorial or a YouTube video, or you should just <laughs> ignore it completely. Uh, because what happens a lot is that you end up just reading one type of media that um, probably gels with your values and you ignore everything else. It doesn't really give you a very sophisticated or holistic view of what's going on in general. Now, what colors my perception a lot is the fact that I grew up in Ireland. And you know, the Irish narratives that we had 800 years of oppression and uh, the <laughs> I'm uh, being oppressed again. I wonder if this guy is uh, uh, <laughs> is British. What? Что? Давайте. Не, 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 не хочу. Давайте. Спасибо. Да, я блогер. Я снимаю. Я работаю сейчас. Спасибо. Same to you. So my worldview is is in part uh, colored by having grown up in Ireland. So we had the 800 years of oppression. <laughs> That's the main narrative from the United Kingdom. Ireland had a struggle for its independence against, at the time, the world's superpower, which would have been, you know, the United Kingdom, Great Britain in the 19th century. And we're obviously part of that polity as well uh, for a certain amount of time. And as a result, I feel it's very easy as an Irishman to sympathize with Ukraine because their narrative is pretty similar. They're trying to assert their newfound independence and break ties with their, or distance themselves to a certain extent, I wouldn't say necessarily break all ties, but uh, with their former colonial masters, right? And there are a lot of people here who speak Russian as well as Ukrainian. And, you know, I'm speaking to you in English with my native tongue. So in Ireland, obviously most people today even speak English, the overwhelming majority is their native tongue. Uh, but still there was this struggle for independence in Ireland and it's just, you know, that went back and forth. We actually even signed a treaty that allowed them to have ports <laughs> for a certain amount of time. Uh, the United Kingdom in Ireland on Irish territory. And obviously we still have the island divided with Northern Ireland. That might change actually in the next decade. Uh, let's see, there may be a referendum that might unite Ireland or it mightn't happen. And we have this situation where there are people who are pro-British and pro-Irish uh, identity on the island. So there are a lot of things that overlap. Now that said, I can also see things from the perspective of the imperial power, the United Kingdom, Great Britain, and also from Russia in this uh, context. And mainly that's to do with security, because imagine, well, well kind of was the case in Irish history, if Ireland was, you know, it's there strategically located on the western flank of the island of Britain, it suddenly was in an alliance with powers that are hostile to Great Britain. Obviously, that would be big security risk, sorry for Britain. That's why uh, controlling Ireland, at the very least controlling, if not annexing it, which is what they did eventually, uh, was their solution, right? Now, obviously, we don't live in the 17th, 18th, and 19th, or even 20th centuries in anymore. And, you know, simply annexing Ireland or forcing it to stay in the same uh, alliance or controlling it directly, you know, it's kind of gone out of vogue with anti-imperialism, anti-colonialism, since the Second World War, and 
that's not no longer the case. But still, at the same time, I can understand why Russia would not be exactly overjoyed by Ukraine joining um, alternatives to being in its Eurasian Economic Union, you know, economically and politically, that's the European Union, and definitely uh, joining NATO, uh, which is a security alliance that you know, has created to, as a bulwark to, at the time, Soviet westwards expansion. And really, its raison d'etre today is basically to protect uh, Central and Eastern Europe from Russian revanchism. So, yeah, I can see why Russia wouldn't be overjoyed about that, because then obviously it's got a longer border with, um, you know, with Ukraine joining and potentially, you know, Belarus, if that were to be the case. Uh, then they would have a longer border to defend across the great European plain. That would be rather expensive and, you know, it wouldn't be in their security interest to have to do that. So, um, in summary, I think having grown up in Ireland, it gives me the ability to try and look at things from both perspectives and analyze the media and uh, not just fall into the trap of believing one narrative over another. So, with all that out of the way about the media, and thank you for everyone who sent me articles about what was going on, was concerned for my safety here in Ukraine. Uh, but as you can see, I'm still here. I'm still walking around uh, Odessa, which is obviously one of the cities that was mentioned in the Bilzeitung, in the alleged plan to invade Ukraine. And this is one of the cities. So why am I here? Do I just think it's all hysteria and there's no reason to be concerned at all, having perused the different media? Um, well, in short, I don't see right now, 1st of February, all the elements in place for me to actually think I need to leave Odessa uh, or leave Ukraine. And why is that? Well, in order to start a conflict, it would seem improbable that there would be uh, a minor incursion <laughs> to uh, quote Joe Biden when he seemed to accidentally be bl um, very bluntly honest if I'm to interpret it that way. And two of those key elements are going to be, well, there's actually only really one element because they will probably have enough troops to at least have some sort of invasion if I'm to believe there are, you know, the number of soldiers and forces in place. Um, but there is no Casas Belli, right? So Casas Belli is Latin for, you know, a justification for war, basically, right? They would need to have a reason to justify uh, that military action. And that would probably require either a real event happening, right? Or they would need a propaganda campaign domestically in Russia in order to prepare the population for that. And I don't see either of those right now. So they're basically the same, well, the same coin, just two sides of it. Uh, when I watch a lot of these commentators or news channels that are um, pro, we'll say, r the Russian position or pro-Russian uh, in their coverage, we'll say in, that they're almost like cheering on an invasion of, <laughs> of Ukraine, as perverse as that sounds. They talk about escalation by the Ukrainian side in the conflict in Donbass, basically that they use military action to resolve the Russian-backed separatist control of the cities of Luhansk and Donetsk. Now, that could happen. Is that a casus belli? Russia would probably argue so, because they've given the people who live there, who stayed there, not the people who lived there before, but the people who stayed on, a lot of them have taken on Russian citizenship, and they would claim that they're protecting their, uh, their citizens. I guess that's kind of what Britain did in Ireland, the United Kingdom did in Northern Ireland when they sent all those troops to protect British citizens in a way. Back in the 60s, we just actually had Bloody Sunday, the 50th uh, anniversary, very dark day in Irish history, in Northern Irish history. Um, or they simply create the impression that the Ukrainians have decided to use uh, escalated military attacks. They have their own minor incursion, so we say, <laughs> in Donbass. And that would be through, you know, some sort of false flag or provocation. Uh, fake provocation or maybe an actual provocation in Donbass and reality you're probably not going to know the difference between the two <laughs> either way if that were to happen uh, if you want historical analogy you can look back at what happened in Poland in 1939 with the 
Gleiwitz instance, when Nazi Germany basically attacked a, I think it was like a radio tower on German soil and claimed it was, you know, Polish, uh, Polish soldiers or Polish operatives who did it. And actually, they faked the whole thing and they actually killed some, some Germans <laughs> to make it more convincing uh, when they did that. So, you know, there's obviously, it seems almost ridiculous idea that Poland was plotting to invade Germany uh, in 1939 since they had obviously, Nazi Germany already signed the Molotov Ribbentrop pact with the Soviet Union to actually divide up Poland between them, but they still needed a Casas belly. So there wasn't one coming that, you know, for obviously domestic consumption for Germans to believe that they had been attacked by Poland. So, I mean, you're not going to say, as I said, you're not going to know whether it's a false flag or it's a real, you know, a real uh, attack probably, well, both sides would probably, in that case, uh, claim uh, the opposite to each other. So in any case, that is not, that hasn't happened. So for me, um, I don't see a reason to panic. Uh, basically, I guess in summary, real brinkmanship or really good brinkmanship is indistinguishable <laughs> from really preparing to invade. And uh, uh, that's what makes it so hard to know. I mean, the Ukrainian uh, government in the last week seemed to be trying to claim that Putin is basically bluffing, that he's not really going to do anything at the end of the day. It's just a tactic to um, improve his negotiating position. We're trying to get the Ukrainians to negotiate under the Minsk Protocol. Uh, there are the agreements to do with Donbass in the east of the country. Or he really is uh, trying, planning to invade or has to do something to quote uh, President Biden. <laughs> but, you know, it's very hard to distinguish between the two if it's well done, isn't it? So, again, I can't tell. I'm just looking for signals to tell me that uh, there may be an invasion or not. So, uh, Casas Belle, you know, in the east of Ukraine, or maybe something to do with the pipelines, obviously Nord Stream uh, 2, the pipeline is kind of a subplot in all of this. Uh, energy supply in Russia's control over a lot of Europe's energy supply is obviously a factor in all these geopolitical calculations, even if I still see it as a bit of a subplot, but maybe, you know, something happens to a pipeline and it just justifies some minor incursion or, you know, there are pipelines that run through here in Ukraine, or there is a conflict those happen to get damaged, you know, increasing um, Europe's and Germany's energy dependence on a Nord Stream 2. These are a lot of subplots as I said going on in the background and I still stand by what I said in that video a month ago. I still think an escalation in the military conflict here between Russia and Ukraine would be mad. I think it's illogical and I hope that there is, you know, cooler heads prevail basically and that we avoid that because um, it can happen even if it is illogical, even if there isn't a uh, big strategic gain from you know a conflict for example look what has happened here in ukraine since 2014 and the annexation of crimea and the beginning of the war in donbass well russia's influence in the country has waned because people in crimea and in the east of ukraine which is under the separatist control they don't vote in ukrainian elections anymore and that takes out you know a lot of people who might have lent lean towards uh, Russia, more Russia-friendly political parties, like in the last, you know, in the presidential election 2010 and 2000, and uh, I guess it was four when Yushchenko won. It was very small, the margins. We're talking about just a percent or two both times. So, you know, that was the old reality before 2014. Now, parties that lean towards Russia get, I guess, somewhere between 15 and 20 percent uh, in Ukraine, they're not really that relevant nationally, right? There's not going to be, you know, like a, a Russia-friendly candidate who's going to get 50%, it would seem. So it's actually had the opposite effect uh, for Russia's interests, from what I can see, anyways. And, you know, annexing uh, Crimea and the war in Donbass starting has probably, it seems, also strengthened Ukrainian national identity and made them, well, less likely to vote for Russia, Russia friendly candidates as well. So I just don't see the strategic interest in doing it. But 
Often wars start because of miscalculation, a misperception, or just they've already set everything up for an invasion. That's what I refer to with good brinkmanship, and then it just happens. So hopefully we avoid all that. So now on to the bit that maybe we're most interested in is, should you be planning to come to Ukraine right now? Now, a lot of people are going to say, hell no, I'm going to wait till things calm down. And all this has been resolved either way. And that would be a pretty prudent, uh, sensible option to take. But, you know, there aren't very many tourists here at the moment. And life goes on as normal as you see everywhere is open. Cafes, uh, restaurants, bars, clubs. Um, it's actually a pretty cool time to come to Ukraine, ironically, because there aren't so many tourists around. So, you know, your Airbnb or your hotel is probably going to be uh, significantly less at the moment just because there isn't so much demand and everything goes on. You're not going to have the hordes of horny foreigners who chase girls here in Odessa. Uh, they don't seem to be around here as much as also winter, of course. So there's not as many people visiting Odessa. Uh, so maybe fortune favors the brave, brave or the foolhardy in coming here. Uh, I obviously haven't left. I plan to stick to my original plans for this month, which were to go to uh, the west of Ukraine anyways, because I think the Carpathians are great at this time of year. May also make a quick visit to somewhere in the center of Ukraine to do a vlog. Just have to see in the next week how things work out. So um, if you are, I will put it this way, if you are willing to plan accordingly for a possible early departure on your trip, then yeah, by all means come to Ukraine. I don't think uh, right now there's no reason on February 1st not to come. Everything is pretty much as normal and you'll have an excellent time, I'm sure. So how should you plan for an eventuality that you might have to leave? Well, there are a few things and obviously these are also things I do and what I did also with my clients when they came to uh, Kharkiv, in particular in December where there was already this tension, is that you got to have an exit plan. It doesn't have to be that elaborate. Like, for example, uh, I'm not, you know, I'm going to just leave with my suitcase. My suitcase is already there anyways. And if you're coming to travel here, then, you know, probably only have one suitcase. It's a little bit different if you've already moved and you have to, you know, you have an apartment here and you got to move a lot of stuff. Um, but basically, be ready to leave at short notice. Have cash, just in case there's an issue with payment systems, card systems and whatnot. Just make sure you have enough cash uh, to get out of where you happen to be. Uh, if you are east of the Dnieper River, you're going to need to figure out how you're going to get at least the other side of the Dnieper River or to the airport. Um, you know, what's the quickest way? Do you have cash? Uh, do you, you know, do you have the number, phone number, or do you know whether you can get a taxi if, you know, the internet is down, for example? And that's what, you know, you'll have enough time to get to the airport and take a flight. But if, you know, there's already a conflict that started, uh, that might be possible. So then you've got to have already thought about where, you know, where you're going to go, uh, where you're going to make a beeline for uh, so that you're not in danger, potentially in danger. So um, that would mean if you're, say, in Kharkiv, you got to figure out how you're going to get to the, the west of the Dnipro. I would say principally uh, how to get to the Carpathians region um, because there you're not going to be at risk or to a, to a land border. If you can't obviously make it to the airport, first thing, I guess, have cash. Make sure that you have a way to get to the airport where you are and feeling that, that you're able to, you know, get to a, a, a region of Ukraine that's going to be less in danger or to a, a land border and then be able to cross it. And you should be good to go. I made that sound so easy, right? But that's basically um, how I've <laughs> structured things for myself. And it might sound like I'm being a bit blasé about it, but the reality is that Ukraine has had this threat since 2014 and life has gone on and um, yeah until that eventuality becomes reality that's basically the way I would approach things and uh, definitely not panic in the meantime and uh, but you know if you don't feel secure or you don't really have a reason to be here and you prefer to take a holiday in uh, another part of Europe or another part of the world and go maybe where it's warm then by all means go and do that as well. So in conclusion, will I have to flee a new Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine? Well, I certainly hope not. As I said, I think we'd be mad, the whole thing. Uh, but I do have a contingency plan in place. And in the meantime, I'm going to go around and do the things that I had planned to do in any case with that in mind. And uh, yeah, I got a lot of great 
content coming up on the channel. Uh, you know, this isn't a political channel, uh, so I rarely really want to make these videos. It's just that, obviously, I receive so many messages and people, uh, enough people seem interested in my opinion about what's going on here on the ground in Odessa in Ukraine. So, um, yeah, till the next video and stay safe wherever you are. Don't be too unduly panicked if you are in Ukraine or if you were planning to come. And Dobobachna, Desvidanya from Odessa Mama in Ukraine. Ciao, ciao. Sar Experience.